So welcome everybody out to the Communitech ODX uh, Open Data Hub. Uh, we're really happy to be here tonight and happy to have you join us. Uh, things are going to be a little bit uh, different than how we normally do things, which is we used to have a networking session uh, or, or uh, our speakers break out for a networking session and then have the speakers. Now we're just going to do back-to-back -back speakers um, and then the networking session. So, uh, and this is all possible by the volunteers that, that helped me put these events on. So Katrina, Anita, Bailey, and Justin. And also tonight the change is uh, Justin's gonna be our moderator and uh, introduce uh, everybody to, to the uh, stage. So I'm gonna let Justin come in and take a look. Oh no, don't, no, no. <laughs> no, no. Definitely not the most qualified person in the room. So please don't come with that. Um, so what is IoT Waterloo, real quick, for anybody who's here for the first time? Um, these are Ian's words um, that were a peer-to-peer -peer network, but I like to think of us as a community, a community that thrives on collaboration. Now, if this is your, again, this, this is your first event, we throw these once in a while. We'd like to invite entrepreneurs to come and speak about their business and how their business fits into the technology of IoT. Um, they're the industry experts, they're the leaders, and we're really happy to have them here tonight. Before we really get started, we should thank the people that help make this possible beyond the volunteers, and that's our sponsors, that's Communitech, and that's ODX. Now what's happening tonight, like I said, we have two entrepreneurs, or not entrepreneurs, two business leaders. Um, they're here to share their story, um, Pino and Matt. Uh, after which we're going to have a networking session. We encourage you to meet someone new and, and learn something new. At least one of the two, if not both, uh, if you walk away with that, I promise you it won't be a waste of time tonight. Now, I only have a little bit to say about Pino you know, before I introduce him. Um, the first thing that I think about when I think about the IoT is, is what systems are connecting together. And that's, that's a layman speaking, okay, so I apologize. The first system that I think about is my vehicle. It's probably one of the first technologies that became connected to every other technology in our life. One of the first questions I ask myself are, how do we keep that data safe? How do we keep it secure? And beyond that, I think Pino can probably explain a little bit better about what eScript is doing to do exactly that. So, without further ado. Thank you. Thank you. Up into the CAN bus, you can get a ton of data, but you need this like little black box that plugs in and, and sucks up all the data. So we make those black boxes. Um, but we specialize on trying to unlock signals that are beneficial for electric vehicle and electric vehicle adoption. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get into that. But I have a, a bit of a weird objective tonight, and my objective over the next 15 minutes is for you when you walk or drive or bike home that you have a completely new appreciation for some things that you're gonna drive by multiple times, and they're. They're these highly, ah, oh. okay, the clicker's not going to work, unfortunately. Or, oh, I just got to plug it in, right? <laughs> Sorry, my bad. <laughs> these things. So you probably walk by hundreds of these every day, or at least tens of them. Uh, the, the gray buckets that are on the top of poles, or the green boxes that are on the edge of your property. Right. So those are the distribution transformers. They take the voltage from 15 to 40,000 volts, which is what we run on our wires near people's homes, down to 240 volts. So, you've never really cared about them. I hope by the end of 15 minutes from now, you kind of care about them. So, but before we get into that, why do we need EVs? In Ontario, it's pretty simple. If you look at the greenhouse gas impact of a gas vehicle on a per kilometer basis, it's about 220. If you look on an EV, it's about eight. This includes the upstream emissions, right? This is not, uh, not discounting the fact that we do burn some things to make some of our electricity. So when you look at that, you look at like a 94% reduction in greenhouse gas. Why is that important in Ontario? Well, 35% the biggest piece of the pie of emissions in Ontario is related to transportation. And the biggest sub-piece of that pie is related to road transportation and gasoline. So it's the biggest single piece of a very large pie that we're desperately trying to shrink. So I live in Alora, and if you put that in the context of Alora, and, and, and I, I want to be clear, I really like LEDs. Most of my house is LEDs, so I'm not an anti-LEDer. 
But if you're talking about greenhouse gas benefit, if you think about my hometown of Alora, we could either put 10 LEDs in every single home in Alora, or we could get 10 EDs. So you could put 10 high efficiency bulbs in every single house, all 3,000 plus homes in Alora, or you can get 10 EVs, and that is the same greenhouse gas benefit. So if you have to say, hey, I have to go around and I have to convince every single person in Alora to put LEDs in all their house or I can just get 10 people to buy an electric vehicle, which is 0.2% of the vehicles, it really articulates how easy it is to get big greenhouse gas reductions with EVs. But I figured I'd do some math equations because I figured in an IoT meetup there's a lot of us math nerds. Why we need EVs and why I think EVs are going to win are not the same but actually completely different. We need them to win because of greenhouse gas, but that's not why they are going to win. And I think if we think about why other technologies have won, it's pretty simple. When you think about flat screens, why did a flat screen win? Or has anyone bought a CRT in the past four years? <laughs> okay, good, because he would have completely disproven my point. I saw a hand sort of like start the wedge up there. But, why did we buy flat screens? We bought because we get bigger screens with higher resolution and our living rooms looked kick-ass when we put a big flat screen on the wall, right? Did you ever really think that flat screens are more efficient? They are. We didn't give a shit. Like that's not why we bought a flat screen. We bought a flat screen because it was a better piece of technology. It was bigger, it was higher resolution. It made our living room look better. That's why we bought it. So when we think about EVs, they're faster, they're smoother. My EV is full every morning. The first scheduled maintenance on the Bolt is at 240,000 kilometers. Powertrain maintenance, sorry, powertrain. But like, just think about that. You buy a Bolt and the first powertrain maintenance is in eight years, 240,000 kilometers. No oil changes, no spark plugs, no timing belts. It just don't happen, right? It's simpler for autonomy and it's simply better tech. So. If you love gas stations, you love repair shops, and you love Windows Vista, please continue to drive a gas vehicle. <laughs> if that doesn't meet your criteria, please go electric. P.S. It's really efficient. P.S. It's really good for the environment. But that's not why EVs are going to win. So what's the problem? It's pretty simple. The rate at which we need EV adoption to rise is significantly, significantly higher than it is today. We need to dramatically accelerate it for the greenhouse gas reasons. So this is my, without showing you my magic history algorithm, my magical algorithm of EV sales. You know, there's there's five things that drive EV sales rate: the quality and availability of product, buyer education, ownership experience, barriers, and pricing. And so, just on the concept of pricing, my Volt is five years old. When I bought my Volt, the battery in it cost sixteen thousand dollars. Today. That new battery for my Volt that's sitting out in the parking lot over there is $3,000. So again, in the context of five years, my Volt's not that old. That was a $16,000 battery, now it's a $3,000 battery. And there's been no massive breakthrough technology innovation. It's simply incremental improvement year over year with increasing volume. And that battery has come down dramatically in price. And that's why we have things like the Chevrolet Bolt that in Ontario you can get for just a hair under $30,000 because GM wanted it after incentive to be just under $30,000. And it's a 383 kilometer electric vehicle that's available now. And the Tesla Model 3 deliveries start on Monday. So it's a pretty good time. So what does Fleet Karma do? We, we play at three levels. Um, buyer education, especially for fleets, we clip those devices into gas vehicles across the fleet. And we, twel we tell a fleet manager where they could and should go electric. We get the data off the gas vehicles, run it through models and say, this is where EVs have enough range, and this is where they'll save you money. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. Ownership experience, we do some things for both fleets and individuals. It's not really what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about barriers. So let's go back to our heroes. So, why do I think when you walk home tonight, I hope you care just a little bit more about these guys? So in most of Ontario, one of those distribution transformers, which I'll call a feeder, serves about 10 homes. Most of Ontario, that feeder is a 50 kVA feeder, which is about 50 kilowatts. Who here has a 100 amp service in their home? Who here has a 200 amp service in their home? Who here has no friggin' idea what amperage they have in their home? 
Okay, you probably have 100, 150, or 200. Probably one of those three. If you have 200, 200 that means you have a 50 kilowatt ability on your heads. You have the ability to suck every piece of power off this, off this computer. But you don't come home and turn on all your lights and turn on all your stereo system and then turn on your air conditioner, but also somehow turn on your furnace to get as much power dry as you could because the fan. And then you run your washing machine and your clothes dryer and everything at the same time. You don't. So what they do is they average it out and they say on average each home is going to draw five kilowatts. And at some point in the summer we'll hit it. And because the systems can, you can overload a theater a little bit. It's not a big deal when it goes a little bit over. But because you know what I'm really passionate about, you probably know where the issue is about to arise. And each home is rated for five kilowatts. So if you think about a feeder in Ontario that services 10 homes, anyone want to guess how many, e how many vehicles live off that feeder on average? 17. We average 1.7 vehicles per home. So you now have 10 homes and 17 vehicles. What happens when five of those 17 go electric? So I'm going to show you a curve of some real-world results of a project we did in Toronto where we clipped our devices into a bunch of EV owners vehicles and for six months we didn't change their charging habits. We just, we just measured how their charging habits were. This is basically the local utility said, hey, we can have 28 kilowatts extra load on that feeder and we're fine. We have some room on the feeders. These are actually 100 kVA feeders, not 50. They said we can accept 28 and we're not worried at all. You put five leaves in a general week in February, no issue. You put five Tesla or bolts. There's one day where we overrate, but again, remember the transformers can handle a little bit of overrating without much issue. This is very problematic. This gives a heart flutter to utility professionals. Because when you go back here, remember, in some a lot of Ontario we have 50 kVA feeders and five EVs are loading up to 96 kilowatts. Now these are Teslas. Teslas charge generally at home at 10 or 20 kilowatts. You can derate them, but 10 or 20 is most common. So this is where those things you walk by at home, those gray buckets and those green boxes, we really need to help them out. They're coming and they're saying, please help me, because I don't like what I'm seeing or what I'm about to see. And on top of that, on top of overloading those, those pieces of equipment, those assets, we have other really good things that are happening, like rooftop solar. So in California, they talk about the duck curve, and this is saying, because we all hear about put load in the middle of the night, right? That's what we all hear, put load in the middle of the night. If you look at California, because of rooftop solar, they're actually saying, hey, in springtime, put load in the middle of the day, put load in the middle of the day, right? Because we don't have a lot of air conditioning load, because it's March in California, so it's not super hot, but it's bright. And so they have a bunch of rooftop solar, so they have a bunch of rooftop cells that are making power in the middle of the day, but they don't have a lot of power being pulled because they don't run AC. So they're saying, wait, wait, I actually don't want late at night. I actually want you to pull it on to, you know, 3 p.m. Which in other jurisdictions, they're saying, no, no, move it off 3 p.m. I don't want it on 3 p.m. It's really bad. And even when you look at California, they're saying, okay, well, okay, move it, move it into 3 p.m. in the spring, but don't put it there in the summer because that's when we have air conditioning load. And then on fall, like, I want a completely different time. My grandma has the sticker on her fridge about the TOU structure we have in Ontario that has two time zones and three tiers. And my grandma is a very smart woman, and every time I visit her, she says, Matt, can you explain this to me? So can you imagine when we're trying to handle this, right? But there's good news. This is where EVs come in. And so what I want to talk about are EVs in the grid, friends or enemies. They can be really good friends, as long as we shape the EV load. Now again, the sky's not falling. I'm not saying we shouldn't go out and buy EVs because we're going to start blowing up you know, gray buckets and green boxes. But it is something that we have to understand will happen if we don't solve it. We're an IoT meetup. It's an easy thing to solve. If you're a utility, you're looking at your options, you really have either build bigger stuff, put in bigger gray bar buckets, and build bigger green boxes. It's a bit problematic because the green box is a certain size designed for a certain feeder, so they can't just open it up and magically make it bigger. So generally what a utility needs to do is they need to splice in the middle. So now that feeder served 10 homes, they go down five homes and they dig a new hole, and they put in a new feeder, and now each one serves five rather than each one serving 10. That's actually pretty expensive. They also need to take some more of your property. Out. So they don't really like doing that, so it's like, okay, well let's not always look at building large new infrastructure. It's kind of a dumb way to do it. So let's use price signals or smart charging. 
right? So price signals is where it's a TOU or maybe in a more aggressive time of use schedule or smart charging where you can actually dynamically shape the load. So we have, we have systems for both. Under the dynamics reward structure, this is a screenshot from a program. So if you're in New York City, uh, New York City is exclusively using Fleet Karma, which we're really proud of, for a Waterloo company, uh, to incentivize EV owners to charge at times that are good for the grid. And you can make up to 400 bucks US a year, which for most EVs is what it costs you to charge your EV for the year. So if you charge at times that are good for the grid, you get free electricity. If you charge at times that are bad for the grid, we take away that money we're about to give you pretty quickly. So charge at good times, here's money. Charge at bad times, we'll never take money from you, but we'll, we won't give you anything back, right? Plus you get all the data from our system, including battery state of health and a bunch of other things that EV owners really care about. This is actually my dashboard for July. You can see I, I went a little bit into red, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't get the full money back. And then this is one of the participants um, tweeting out that he was really happy with the money here last month, which is great. We're going to do a full screenshot, but the, his tweet right below it had to do with legalization of pot. And it was a little bit off our corporate message, so I had to screenshot just his tweet about us. So. So, so in this case, all we're doing is we're, set, we're basically clipping our devices in the car. We're measuring how much charging is happening and when it's happening, where and when it is happening. And if you're charging at specific places at certain times, you get money back. Right? It's very simple. We're just a measurement tool. In this case, paired smart charging, you're saying, look, I'm coming home and I need to be fully charged by 6.30 in the morning. And we guarantee you, you will be fully charged by 6.30 in the morning. But we get to decide exactly when that load comes on. We can make it the middle of the night if we know that there's going to be a lot of wind. We can delay it for a little bit if we know your two neighbors with Teslas are charging right now and we want to make sure you guys don't overlap. Right? We can actually put everyone on the front end if we're right at the end of the day and we know that there's a lot of solar and we want to suck up that solar. So in Ontario, we run nuclear power plants. Is anyone familiar with the term spilling water is? So we've got a couple folks that know what spilling water is. So nuclear power plants, we don't like to turn them up or down. We like to keep them running at max. Um, so what we do is we heat water and we dump it into one of the Great Lakes um, because we prefer to do that over actually turning down the nuclear power plant. It's not a really great thing to do, right? Uh, to just be heating water and dumping it. So it would be really nice if we just add load so we don't have to spill water. So in this case, top right is one of the nights where um, we started uh, shaping people's load. The curves I showed you before about the five vehicles, right? We imagine magically made them on the same feeder. They were actually all across Toronto, and just by the magic of Excel, we put them on the same feeder. Um, but then we said, okay, well, what if we shape the curve? And you can see the orange is what would have happened if we weren't changing. In this case, we were trying to flatten it, right? We were trying to not overload those gray buckets and green boxes. And then the blue is what happened for the period we were throttling. And you can see that in the case when we're changing load, it's interesting, it's like squeezing a balloon, right? If you flatten it, you actually bulge it over onto the side. So you can see we flattened it in the period we really wanted to flatten it, but we actually created a smaller peak later in the day. But that was okay, because we didn't care about that, because that's when the rest of the house load wasn't happening. So we were fine with a bit of a peak there, as long as it was off when everyone else was using the rest of the house. And then I'll just explain the one on the bottom right. When you talk about shifting load, there's blind smart charging and paired smart charging. Blind smart charging is when you don't have access to the data from the vehicle. And if you don't know the state of charge of the vehicle and how healthy the battery is, you can't guarantee the EV owner that you can get them fully charged by a certain time. Because you're blind, right? Like you just, you know that there's an EV there, it's pulling power, but you have no idea if it needs 20 minutes of charge or four hours of charge, right? And so 72 of the participants said, if you can't guarantee me that I'm fully charged by when I need to in the morning, I will not play. I do not care how much money you're going to give me. I care that I can get to work because I can't say, sorry boss, the utility needed a little less power last night. Yeah. So when we talk about IoT, this is where it talks about the importance of actually having access to that data. So again, I, I showed you two things. I showed you EV price signals where you provide an incentive for EV owners to charge at certain times and not other times, but they completely get to pick when and where they charge. The alternatives, because I thought it'd be interesting in the IoT context, sort of the default historically has been the submeter. This is a second meter you install in the house. People don't like this because you have to bring an electrician and rewire your home. 
The second is to have a network station that goes on the wall. The challenge is most people at home don't have a network station. The third is to use an auto OEM, like an, an automaker's backup. The challenge is, you know, Waterloo North Hydro does not want to set up an agreement with BMW and GM and Ford and every single OEM have different interfaces. They want a one-stop shop. So that doesn't work fun. So telematics is the best in aftermarket measurement device. And I really got to say that right now there's only one company that specializes in getting EV signals. I'll let you guess who. And smart charging if you want data off the vehicle. The industry was moving really fast to get EVs out there. And so when you plug in an electric vehicle, it actually doesn't report anything to the station over that plug other than am I safe to charge or not charge. It doesn't say this is how charged I am, this is how much energy I need. On a level one, level two. On a DC fast charger, there is more data that goes across, but on the plugs that you would normally charge, uh, uh, none of that important data goes across. There's now an effort to say, hey, actually, we really need that data. So there's a standard about actually getting that data to go across that connector. And they're about to agree on that standard, which means cars in 21, 22 will start having that standard. But it's 2017. So uh, that might be helpful in the future, but it's not there now. And then again, the automakers uh, have a good potential option here. But again, the utilities want a single one-stop shop. They don't want to have 18 interfaces. And again, there's one telematics company that specializes in it. So we are king and queens of a very, very small castle. If you want to get data off of EVs, we are the best in the world at it. There's not a lot of ton of people right now that want that ability. Uh, but fortunately for us, it's growing for people. So I, I deliberately took off the y-axis. It's not an accident. That's our revenue. I like, I like the curve. <laughs> for all of you know, the top could be ten dollars, but it shows the curve. Uh, I know we've got Sarah here and Mike here. Mike's wearing the blue shirt, so he stands out. For that was completely intentional, as he says no. Um, okay, what really excites me? The last thing, just about working on what we do. You know, these are my daughters. When we look at climate change, like I, I really am concerned. And I think at some point it's going to be fair if one of them comes to me and says, you know, Dad, what'd you do when the air got warm? And I'm really glad that I'm going to have a good answer. So, if you want to have a good answer, we're hiring. Thanks. So, questions? Before that, just show of hands. Who will have a little bit more appreciation for those green buckets and green boxes? Sweet. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. What about the solutions like having a power wall incorporated into your house that averages the load, like it can be charging during the day yep. to provide the power at night to charge your vehicle? So I would say a power wall is uh, the closest thing to a direct competitor we have. Right, because the power wall can shape it for the benefit of the local distri uh, distribution transformer, and it can also help suck up energy at certain times of the day, and it can do arbitrage. So that is a completely alternative solution, and I think there's there's good pros and cons to both sides. The pros and cons, the, the pros for something like a power wall, is that you can really ramp it up or down. It's two ways. Its sole job in life is to do these kind of services. The con of the power wall is that it's a not inexpensive system that you're now adding on. So the thought is if you can manage EV load naturally to the benefit of the grid, you're not paying for something else, right? It's, there's no incremental cost other than networking, and so you're not gonna get the total kilowatt or kilowatt hour benefit, but the cost per service will be less. But we're gonna see how that's gonna play out, and actually I think quite frankly both are gonna exist. Um, I just don't yet know which one's gonna be the more predominant solution. But it's direct about it. Uh, is anyone talking about actually uh, serving the power grid in an emergency or at a, a, a peak uh, spike? Yeah. You have your car and you, you could still get to full in the morning, but everyone's running the AC or just is it an unusual spike or how many power goes out in your yeah. area? Yeah, so, so that's what I'm referring to as B2G, so vehicle to like two way flow of power back and forth. What we call the smart charging, just throttling it up and down and never bringing power back onto the grid, um, is either called V1G, so one-way flow, or uh, G2V, so core blockers. But anyway, V2G is two-way flow. Um, there's already some systems in Japan where they can run that. After Fukushima, there was a strong desire to be able to island your home and, and provide power back into your home in case of an emergency. 
Um, it's generally viewed as much less likely in about everywhere other than Japan. Okay. Um, it might be a little different if you have something like a power wall, um, but from pulling energy in and out of the vehicle battery, there's certainly less interest. Um, there's certainly more complexity. And from the grid side, there's also a extra complexity because you've got a line worker up on a line and you've got that whole system isolated. If you have a, you know, if you have rooftop solar, your inverter detects that and it's got safety not to do that. You can put that in the car, but now you're adding more cost, right? And these are vehicles where they care about pennies and now you got to put all these extra safety systems in for a limited use case. So it, it, you look at it and you're like, okay, I can get 80, 90% of the benefit by just doing one-way control. Um, but I can get some incremental benefit with two-way, but it comes at a ton of cost. You're talking about a special uh, uh, protocol for uh, chargers? Is that something they're thinking of putting in the possibility in the future? Yeah, yeah. And the, one of the big questions around that is that does the inverter go on board the vehicle or does it go off board the vehicle? Because if it's off board the vehicle, it's lighter. And there's some a bunch of pros and cons. But I would say that controlling the charging rate is uh, like it's, it's ready to be commercialized now. Okay. Um, but there's a thought that there's going to be more of that in the future. But then people are saying, well, if most people have power walls, then maybe we don't need that in the car. Are you getting data from IESO as to what the grid needs to balance any particular moment? Or you know, so, are you deciding what you need to do? Yeah, so in the, in the Church TO case, yeah. we were in a bunch of specific scenarios that Toronto Hydro wanted us to run. Pretend like there's a grid brown one. Pretend like there's high wind generation. So they want us to run all these scenarios. Um, so we ran through them. In California, with there's a fairly similar project with BMW and PG&E, the local utility there in, in San Francisco, where they were tied directly into the market. So they were tied into the equivalent of ISO and they were taking market signals. So, uh, sorry, the short answer is we are not in the project that I showed you. Um, there's a couple other projects where we we buy derivative car, but we're not involved in the BMW version. But that's where it's going. That's 100% where, where it's going, right? It's, it's, but it's not in, you don't get that data now. We do not feed it into the system as I've shown you there. But ultimately, the intent is to tie the value of the service to the market. And whatever service can provide it, whether it's us or you know, solar or grid storage, like we'll play in the market as much as everyone else will like. At what point, you mentioned the price of the batteries are coming down, at what point will a swappable battery be uh, effective against the charge time? Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of views on that. Um, I'm strongly on the not gonna happen side of that equation. Uh, I just, we worked for years with the, auto, with the automakers. Yeah their appetite or interest in having a battery that swaps into another automaker's vehicle is near zero. Uh, you could have it swap within the own OEM, but then it's like, well, there are different states of degradation. And, and so when you kind of work through all the complexity, I, I don't see it happening. I think the benefit of it happening is a quick recharge, right? And like that's the main intent is I want to pull in and within three, four minutes, I want to be able to pull out the full battery. The industry is now moving from 50 kilowatt fast chargers to 150 kilowatt fast chargers as they're now getting deployed. And Porsche just installed the first 350 kilowatt uh, fast charger at their headquarters. Now, if you want to see, you know, a utility person's face go red, talk about that. Uh, but that's a competing alternative to fast recharge, right? My argument is, like, if a car can go 500 kilometers and it takes 20 minutes to recharge. After 500 kilometers, after I drive to Ottawa, I'd like a 20 minute break. Um, so for me, the complexity of battery swaps or 350 kilowatt chargers, I, I think it's a marginal return personally. Um, so I think my answer would be, I don't think battery swaps are gonna happen, but there's a lot of people who think I would get it wrong on that. What uh, software technology stack are you using? Uh, I'm sorry? What software technology stack are you using? On the device or on our backend? Or both. both. <laughs> so device Mike could answer much better than I could. Make our own stack. So we make our own stack on top of the device, and then uh, on cloud side we run on Azure, and um, we're a full video studio. Any last questions?
another one. So <coughs> with uh, electrical vehicle proliferation, there is a problem with the batteries, yeah? How you recycle, I, I mean, is the industry ready to, for the mass adoption of electrical vehicle, how to recycle the batteries? Because there are voices saying that they can be worse for the environment if you don't recycle them right. Yeah, so uh, I think the question was, A, is the industry ready to be able to re recycle a large volume of batteries? And second is there's concerns around the general environmental friendliness of batteries, especially if you don't recycle. And so the answer to the first one is, that, yes, we're, the industry is fully ready to recycle. There's very strict recycling rules, especially in Europe. So any vehicle you sell in Europe has to meet very, a very large amount of that vehicle has to be fully recyclable. And so you can sell large numbers of EVs. So that's already happening. There's nothing about the recy battery recycling facilities that's not already known. We have to build more of them because there'll be a lot more batteries, um, but it's mainly just copy and paste, right? So there's, not a, there's no technology that has to be developed for us to cost effectively recycle batteries. That's, that's well understood. Uh, as far as the environmental performance, yeah, it, there's a few small amounts of trace chemicals in the battery you have to be careful about. There's a lot of more nasty chemicals in a gas vehicle when you do the recycling you have to be cautious about, and it's not an issue on the gas vehicle side. And so it's not an issue on the battery side. So in the recycling process, depending on the specific chemistry you have, there are certain chemicals you have to be a bit more cautious about. But that's the same if you're recycling anything. If you're recycling a lead acid battery, there are certain things you have to be a little cautious about. But the process are set up to treat that carefully. There's also a big demand for used batteries being reused for other applications. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so like in the BMW. It's not the big yeah, issue. yeah, the secondary life. I, I, I think in some cases there will certainly be more and more uses for secondary life. Um, the, ch the challenge of secondary life right now is if you think about my battery that was $16,000, it's now $3,000 for a new battery. Even if you paid me 20 cents on the dollar for what my battery cost me when I bought it, because it's still a very good battery, that's $3,200. So you could have my five-year-old battery that's traveled 203,000 kilometers for $3,200, which is 20 cents on the dollar what I paid for it, or you could have a brand new one for 200 bucks less, right? So the secondary use is a little challenging right now, but I think as those costs plateau, there'll be more and more interest in that. And in the BMW PG&E project that I talked about, they included controlling of the vehicles, but they also had a bunch of old mini E batteries. So they took a bunch of batteries out of old mini uh, electric vehicles, and they used it as supplemental uh, grid storage for that service. So you had vehicles and grid storage operating in tandem. I think I'm pretty sure I'm out of time. Yeah, unless, I mean, maybe like one more question. I don't think there's a big rush. If there isn't anything else. We we'll probably get a big round of applause from that. Uh, so I won't say too much because there's still, I think, half a keg of beer, and I was told engineers knew how to drink. So Ian has told me that it is an open invitation to help us at least stay for another half an hour to help us out because I'm not bringing it home. Um, I've got a pregnant wife who will not let it through the door. So, um, I, you know, before we, we break into more networking, um, on behalf of the whole group, thanks very much to all you guys for coming. Um, thanks to everyone who spoke and who helped out tonight. Uh, thanks to the sponsors. I know I'm supposed to, I'll, I'll click through the sponsor page, but really it's Communitech. Um, and, uh, and it's ODX for letting us use this space. Um, but the biggest thank you is to the whole group. Uh, if it's your first night here, um, it wasn't too long ago that I had my first night here, and it's, it's really you guys who allow us to, to do all this. Like Matt and, and Pino wouldn't be here, none of us would be here doing this, and it continues to grow larger and larger. So uh, before I, I let you all go, who here learned something new tonight? Now, who here met someone new tonight? For those of you who haven't raised your hand yet, uh, we, we're going to have a networking session right now, so there's still time. Uh, so you know, grab a drink, meet somebody, and have a great night.